Hello and welcome to Mutually Assured Conversation. I am here with court astrologer and theatre kid, Glass Delusions, um, who um, has been on this before and has recently joined me and my co-host, Owen Leishon on uh, Schizo FM, if you want a more uh, party atmosphere, fun time conversation. But today we're going to talk about serious stuff. So, uh, Glass Delusions, what have you been working on recently? What have I been working on? I have been working on something called meta historical systems analysis, which is basically just astrology. But we we call it meta historical systems analysis because there's a branch of astrology that is called mundane astrology, which is the astrology of global events. So it looks at the impact of the outer planets. So Pluto, Neptune, and Uranus sometimes Saturn, um, occasionally Jupiter, and how and those outer planets affect global situations like they are not those are not personal planets, they don't have the same impact on an individual's natal chart, they have an impact on multiple years in a row, um, three to 10 to 200 years, these alignments of these planets have have effects. So they affect the world. And that's mundane astrology. But when you start to when you start to look at history and you start to really like when you're looking at, at history you can also map astrology onto that and it becomes it becomes an interesting methodology with historical analysis i mean arguably like historical analysis you you are looking at a chain of events you're looking at geopolitical contexts contexts of like what's happening uh, you know, to certain people at a certain time to like, so, like important people in politics, you know, and, and, and you're looking at all of you're sort of analyzing as a historian, all of these outside factors that are causing, um, or, or adding, uh, different factors into, to create this, these chain reactions of, of, of events basically. And, but you can do the same thing with astrology and you can say like, well, in the 1760s, um, I actually this is I'm I'm ill prepared with my dates here, but like in the in the late 18th century, Casanova is uh, you know this poly polymath Renaissance man in Venice, and then you can say like what was happening, what was happening with the planets at that time, and how were those planets arranged next in the future, and you can say like oh well they were arranged the same way. The planets were arranged the same way during the early 20th century as they were when Casanova was around. And so in the early 20th century, you have these artists who are these uh, burgeoning modern artists who are like creating their own kind of like new renaissance of the West kind of thing. So do you see what I'm getting at? That's a very complicated circuitous <laughs> description, but you can sort of analyze history through the lens of astrology and that, that strengthens yeah. your prediction. Yeah, I, I, I see your, I see your point. I, I wanted to kind of zoom out a little bit and just think about um, his, I guess the study of history in general. Um, I suppose listening to some of your other podcasts, I was just thinking about how different views of time, like what time is, actually impacts the way we see history. I mean, to give, um, so the kind of, academic answer I've heard a lot, and I don't know if you agree with this or not, but the academic answer is that pretty much everywhere across the world, every single culture has viewed time cyclically in some sort of circle, right? Or mm -hmm. some sort of wheel shape, some sort of wheel shape. Mm -hmm. um, the West is unique in the fact that it seems to um, implement these linear histori historiographies where, and, this, and then this comes into metaphysical assertions about time being a thread going one direction time being a sequence of you know events that follow each other in in a, in a big chain um and i suppose that so to give examples of kind of the linear view, historical view of time which has both philosophical and secular and religious kind of interpretations in the west i mean to give the obvious religion one the um you know christianity has a linear historiography of it you know it's got um depending on where you start it, it you know it starts with the genesis story it goes 
goes through the story of uh, Christ. And then, you know, we are somewhere between the story of Christ and Revelation, basically. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting how I think that this carries on into, I guess, so-called secular Western views of history. I mean, such as um, you have the Hegelian view of history where, or I guess, I, I guess it'd be more fair to say the liberal, the Whig view of history, where um, history is an event of human progress, where humans are separate from animals and nature. They have their own separate thing and they are forever progressing to a brighter future. And then you obviously, you have the Hegelian view as well, which is that um, history is a system of, of dialectic and it is inevitably approaching this, this point in the future. But what I wanted to point out about these these views of history, like Western views of history, is that they view these things as inevitable. Mm -hmm. I don't know. What, I don't know if you have any reflections on that. Basically, yeah. I mean, I well, it's good that you bring up Christianity because I would say that it's because of Christianity that we have linear time, because the Christianity is very teleological, mm -hmm. and the and and it's sort of this perfect as above, so below kind of metaphor where it's like, well, if you're progressing toward heaven mm. and eventually like you'll die, like then it's, it everything becomes linear. Everything becomes this linear journey toward heaven because if it were all cyclical, like where, where do you put heaven on, on the wheel? Um, and, and so I think that, I mean, my uh, go-to sort of reflexive answer here is to say that it's, uh, symptom of the age of Pisces, the Christianity, <laughs> the Christian, Christianic age. Um, and, and so that's of course going to dominate like the West embodies Christianity, the West embodies teleological thought and philosophy. And that's going to, and then when the West, as the West has dominated over the last 2000 years, then so, so does linear time, linear time sort of takes over. Um, yeah. And it's interesting because then, yeah, that reflects once you enter into living linear time, then that reflects back on how you view history. It's it's a really fascinating, fascinating thing. And it's super weird. I had such I had such a hard time in in like high school and, and, uh, and middle school with like, and we all. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, it all sucks. But uh, with the B.C. into the A.D., yeah like uh -huh. at that where you like are counting backwards and then there's just like a break and then you're counting forwards nobody i just felt like that was so weird i felt like i felt totally gaslit because i was just like it was a crisis for me as like a 13 year old <laughs> or whatever you know like i was like why is this like weird arbitrary and i went to catholic school and so they were like well it's after the year that christ was born and it's just like there's more <laughs> there's more to it like what is going on here i never got a sufficient answer and um, I haven't really like gone down the rabbit hole either. Um, I sort of got over my existential crisis about it, but it was just like, that's, that's a very weird thing to like, just have this clear break because you're that committed to linear time. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a bit ridiculous, but also the other, the other thing, I, I think that I've maybe talked to you about this before, but um, I've said it before on other podcasts, uh, linear time really takes a, its hold on Western society with the introduction of electricity as well. Because right. like you can't, even if you're, even if you have this like teleological sense of being and you're always striving towards something and progressing that like you're still, your day-to-day -day life and your calendar life is still a cycle. You still have right. all the four seasons and, and the cycle of a day like crescendos from dawn until dusk again. Um, but then when you have electricity, you can extend daylight forever and it's just this or you can ex you know you can just go on and be in the daytime um so yeah that is really when linear time like you can't that's a point of no return kind of thing yeah i remember when i was younger and this probably says something about my level of intelligence is that when i was told about bc and ad i was always like i bet before ad they were like really really worried about what was coming up because obviously they'd be looking at the date and it'd be counting down. <laughs> it took me a while to put the put things together on that one. 
Yeah. Well, but in in a sense, though, it's it's interesting because in a sense, like there were astrologers who were sort of counting down to that to that moment, sort of. I mean, there were astro like that's biblically documented as like the the magi, the three the three wise men who are counting down to a specific astrological alignment. Um, and, and then it's only just, you know, 300 years later that the early Christian church actually institutes the birth of Christ as like this break in time. But, um, but that's the interesting thing too about cyclical time and like what you look, what you're looking for, what you're, what you're anticipating is like, there's cyclical time. People tend to, I think that people maybe impulsively shy away from it because they're like cyclical time doesn't make sense because then everything would just like repeat and everything would look the same. And it's just like, well, the seasons look the same, but they, they don't repeat exactly. It's just, it's a rhyming. It's sort of like this, it's not a flat circle. It's a spiral that is, you know, you're either ascending or descending, but it, it never actually looks exactly the same. And, but that's the thing too, is that like with, um, when you're when as an astrologer, when you're anticipating these major alignments, you know, the, the planets go in this um, in like a like the, the planetary cycles go in sort of a clock motion where it's like the, the planets align and then they make a 90 degree angle to each other and then they make their opposition to each other and then they have their like fourth or third align uh, square alignment and then they meet again. And so I don't know you you even though it's a circle like you still have these moments that you're counting down toward yeah. in a way that yeah there's still anticipation well it just it shows how powerful the psyop of linear time is you know it's just as just as powerful as the morality of christianity is is this the psyop yeah. of linear time and i would i just want to this is a this is a weird philosophical aside but i want to get this out of the way so more people know about this the whole the this quote time is a flat circle is often misattributed to nietzsche okay and it's Nietzsche didn't never said that. Okay, never said that. Um, it is a quote from True Detective. Okay, um, and there's something about Nietzsche in the show, but it's not really like actually based on him. But so so in Thus Spake Zarathustra, there's a there's a dwarf character. There's lots of weird characters in Zarathustra, and he says all truth is crooked. Time itself is a circle. But people often quote it to something like the genealogy of morals, like one of his polemics, where he's actually like putting that forward as a metaphysical truth huh Interesting. and it really irritates me because again people run into that conceptual difficulty you're talking about where it must be nietzsche's um eternal recurrence which again is is a, just simply a thought experiment about almor fatty for him it's not like a metaphysical assertion that all things repeat themselves like people really misunderstand this and that's most because most people don't actually read the fucking book which is really annoying. yeah 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 um, but, but basically my point was that um I, th I think you, you said this. You said this somewhere else, and I wanted to point out as a like for people who are struggling with this conceptually, you should instead of thinking about time being literally a circle, you should think of it as cyclical. So it's something like a conch shell. Mm -hmm. Like time is still changing and going other places, but there are repetitions within it that you know, like you said, like poetry, they rhyme in certain places, um, but there's there's new stuff coming in all the time. Like it's still an evolving process. Still, a, time is still change. Yeah. And there's new people living in these. I mean, that's what's interesting about like thinking about mundane astrology and, and doing historical analysis according to astrology is like there's all new characters that play on the world stage. There's these themes that that, you know, play out that might be the same or rhyme. Um, and, and these it, we, it's best to think of it in seasons because that's just like where our minds are already at. Yeah. Um, you know, so you have spring and then a full rotation later, you have spring again. And so you, the same sort of themes, it's colored the same way, but there's different people coming in. That's why I say like, you know, you have Casanova, who is this this Renaissance man and making and like making waves with his like sense of humor and like trying to be this like, trying to do everything, trying to do it, like be creative, be a creative person. And then a few generations later at around the same time, you have the, the uh, early modern artists who are like also similarly trying to be like these Flenner interdisciplinary, like I'm going to try a little bit of everything kind of kind of thing. So you, you just have different characters who are emerging and finding similar ways to express or like similar ways to like remix that season or whatever. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to, and this is kind of, this is kind of an open question just because of my ignorance, but um, we have to point out that um, the age of Pisces, which uh, again, correct me if I'm wrong here, but it's unique among the star signs for being the sign of monotheism, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, so that's good. Okay, that's good. <laughs> that kind of starts with, um, you know, the emergence of monotheism, such as Christianity, such as um, Islam, such as I guess you could argue the the Buddha is as well. You know, it takes mm -hmm. the um, animisms of the East and you know, general philosophies like Confucianism and stuff, and then unifies them in some way. Um, yeah. What we need to point out is that as you know, we're about a hundred years from the age of Aquarius and I guess it's, it's speaking about you know, cycles and how the, how time is reflected in the natural universe is that time with the, the emergence of the monotheisms, that is the spring and summer of Pisces. That is it at its, at its height. Right. And mm -hmm. right now we're in the winter of Pisces. Yeah. Yeah. Which is reflected in our, you know, in our zeitgeist in the fact that the, you know, the West itself seems tired, for example. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. It seems tired and is going to sleep and is kind of like also um, acting out as though afraid, uh, as though trying to gather for, for the this start. This is the thing, right, is that I think that I've had a neurosis for the linear time stuff for a while. And, mm -hmm. you know, naturally, if you're someone who... Um, you know, doesn't think that the fruits of the West were entirely bad. You're like, oh, we need to like reverse this trend where we're dying, where we're going into winter. You know, we need to like reverse this against. But it, if it's if it, if it isn't, if cyclical time is true and there is actually a natural cycle where all things have their spring, their summer, and then they fall into winter, it's perhaps like an inevitable thing. And you should embrace the fact that it is the winter. Um, because another, another thing that, I've sort of realized is that, you know, being a perspectival thing, there are actually cycles within cycles, you know? So there is, absolutely. Um, there's a way to be a hero in the winter, for example. It's not, you don't just, you don't just get to be a hero in the spring and summer, right? Um, have you read The Fourth Turning? No, I haven't. You've meant it's on my reading list still. Okay. You've mentioned it. Yeah, so yeah. Mentioned it. Okay. I will, I will get around to it. I will. It's, it's interesting that you're using the exact same vocabulary that's in that book. I think I've, I've, ob I've obtained it through osmosis through you and through other people. Yeah. I think yeah. a lot of people I know have read it basically. <laughs> yeah. I kind of read it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I can't, uh, I can't remember off the top of my head, like exactly how, um, how the generations, cause he has this whole, well, it's the two, the two authors have this whole, they, they map it out as these, they map out cyclical time as the seasons. And um, you have the, the spring is the awakening, the summer is the high, and then the fall is the unraveling, and the winter is the crisis. Mm -hmm. And so um, then you have generational archetypes. And those are also in four um, to, to map onto the season. You have uh, hero, nomad, artist, prophet, I might be getting up the I might be getting mixed up the nomad and ar artist, but I think it's or maybe it's nomad and hero. I can't remember the exact order, but basically they talk about how the how the seasons and the generational archetypes sort of go together. Like heroes come of age during a crisis, and during the winter time, and um and or or maybe they come of age during the unraveling and then they are the heroes they embody that during the crisis and then you have the nomads who are sort of wandering and exploring during the the awakening of the spring and then you have the artists who are exploring and creating things creating new cultural movements in the summer during the high and then you have the prophets who are sort of coming of age in the unravel you know so if i have the order correct that's Great, but that's the center. That's the gist, basically, is that yeah, you have these archetypes who are coming of age at certain times and like express their archetypes during these, during whatever season. And so like you can't you you are more prone to have heroes in a crisis, hard times, great men, or whatever. It's also yeah. like follows that. Um, what's interesting about and of course and yeah, we have talked about this. Like you can map on certain um, astrological significations to these 
hero, nomad, artist, prophet, generational archetypes. Um, it 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 maps pretty pretty well onto astrology. So again, there's just like my my collaborator on Twitter, known as Kali Yuga Surf Club, <laughs> is the um, the person behind this like spiral conch shell map of time that's based oh. on the fourth turning. The met the he calls it the metasecular wheel, and um, and that's what we're doing. We're trying to map the astrological seasons onto this fourth turning based wheel. And that is the meta historical systems analysis. Um, But anyway, yeah. So, so yeah, you have like what's happening in the times, what's happening in the zeitgeist is going to reflect in the archetypes who are coming of age. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What I think is interesting is that linear views of time tend to focus on material conditions. And this kind of reaches its zenith in the extension of Hegelian's Hegelianism, which is Marxism, which is literally just trying to, um, is trying to, you know, make a scientism of material conditions mm-hmm. through, um, through, um, is it material dialectics? I don't remember what it is. Um, anyway, <laughs> I don't like Marxism anyway, so it doesn't matter. Um, but since I've been thinking cyclically, I've been thinking even more archetypally, like, because I've always, I've always, I, you know, I've always um, considered myself at least um Jungian curious you know and I've always thought of ways to think about the world that are archetypal to reflect on my dreams and stuff like this that are archetypal but since I've been thinking about time cyclically I've been thinking like just just generally about people and their place in the world and my place in the world is more more in terms of archetypes Mm -hmm. I don't know if you agree with me I think archetypes are a really useful way to think about the world and they sort of plug into our natural desire for stories and religiosity I'm just wondering what else, if you think they're useful, I'm just wondering how else you think they're useful to think about things. I definitely think they're useful. This is why I'm an astrologer. And why, mm. why I will never hesitate to be like, Virgo, like real Virgo hours over here or something. <laughs> I'll never hesitate to like, you know, just, I, I think that we are, have been disenchanted because of the material dialectic, because of material materialism and this like overly uh like simplified narrowed down narrowed down worlds that we live in now like we have become disenchanted we and what's missing in the way that you re-enchant yourself is to mythologize yourself is to and to mythologize your your history as well too like you know where you came from what sort of like narrative struggles if people did even just personal genealogy of their family, like they would, you would start to notice these really crazy, like if you go back to like your grandparents' generation, um, you know, because children and parents don't, don't, they're, they're too parallel. They're too, they can't really see each other. But if you go back to your grandparents' generation or your great, great grandparents, like you'll start to see certain themes that like repeat themselves. And that's like cycles within cycles. Um, and so, and so, like, that's the first step, I think, really, if people are very skeptical towards astrology as well, is to just, like, even just, you know, think about genealogy, thinking about, like, reading letters written by grandparents or whatever, because you'll start to see certain themes pop up. And, and like, knowing your own personal lore is, like, a great introduction to your own archetypes, like, family archetypes and, uh, and, and personal mythologies. But I think that it's incredibly useful because... Um, you can also think about like how you're coming into like if again if you're astro skeptic like you can think about how you're coming into like oh well when i was born i was you know i guess i was kind of like very creative as a kid so i was this artist archetype or whatever and then i grew into becoming my own hero for myself and then like you know i think that there's ways to map you have to map a story you have to map a narrative onto your life because that is what um that's what that, I mean. That's what gives it meaning, truly. But um, I think that astrology, in particular, is useful for this too, is it, because the way that the twelve zodiac signs are num- ordered and and laid out is like through the life cycle of a person, the life cycle of man. Aries is a baby. It's like the baby of the zodiac. This young whatever. Soon you move on to the next quadrant which begins with um, 
cancer, where you're starting to become a little bit more, it grow into yourself, um, you move on. And then, and then eventually you come back around to like Capricorn, Aquarius and Pisces, which is like the old, the old soul, the elder. And so like you, first of all, you embody these energies just like as yourself, according to your natal chart, but then you also like move through these archetypes, this life cycle of a, of a human. Um, and I think that, yeah, it's a very humanist mission to be archetypally aligned to figure out like, and all, and, and it's great for like goal setting too, you know, like if you're reaching towards something and you say, I want to embody this kind of energy more, um, like when you have an image of it, when you have an archetype that you can map onto, it's easier to sort of make yourself fit the mold. Yeah. And I think that one thing that is annoying when people like, if you read the literature on historiography, one other connection that is often made apart from saying that, oh, the West has a linear view of time is that, oh, the West is based on telos, which is true. But the problem is that's often connected to meaning as well, saying that telos is all about meaning, right? Mm. And I think that's one of the things that has been um, hijacked by the linear view of time is saying that it has a monopoly on human meaning, right? And, you know, that has its really odd, like, bastardized forms where people <laughs> view their own personal time as a um, struggle to get a um, mortgage and then that's like then that's the tea loss you know that's then their life is complete you know or you know you work hard all year and then you get to go on vacation for a week or you work hard your entire life and then you go on retirement that's the tea loss of time um, yeah what you realize actually if you do well if people work hard all day just to get the five o'clock so they can have a drink right um but when you look at like the when you look when you think about things well, the truth of the matter is those things aren't actually linear. They're cyclical. Mm -hmm, you know, like, mm -hmm. like the, okay, yeah, you get to five o'clock and work's over. But guess what happens tomorrow morning, you know? Exactly. <laughs> Everything exactly. starts again, right? Um, and I think, but I think one of the strangest things is that, um, and it's even more true now that we're in our sort of wandering winter phase and we're becoming more obsessed with material conditions, to be frank with you, is that, we view ourselves, and this is, I think this is due to material conditions, is that we view ourselves as entirely extracted and separate from the past. Mm -hmm. We think that, you know, just because our, you know, you know, your great grandparents were in a, a war where only the next like hour really mattered or the next day really mattered or getting food really mattered, that we think that we're separate from that because material conditions are so different. Mm -hmm. But if you, you know, if you, what you realize is actually, Although the exact material conditions of the problems aren't the same, I say that I think that human problems will always have the same theme. Absolutely. And you'll always be able to learn from the the from the same themes from the past, and you'll be able to use them in the same themes moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. And I was thinking about, um, I was thinking about this in like a totally radically different way. I came across this morning on the Twitter timeline, I came across this like, bizarre thread it was like this like crass cartoon animation like very pornographic and it was like um and it was like this is a booty shaking thread let us see you shake your booty you know and then there was a community note that was like this is actually a thread so you immediately posted on there right? <laughs> there was a community note that said um this is an only fans scam to get around the ad regulations for twitter and so I was like, this Twitter thread where it's just like, like, because ostensibly this Twitter account is like, you know, trying to play, trying to play innocent and play coy and just like attract people to respond. But then the women who would respond or the models who any OnlyFans model who would yeah. respond. And so I was just like, this is an e-brothel. Like prostitution is the same, the same. Prostitution is never like, and, and that's probably trite to say, because uh, you know that thought has occurred to many people, but yeah, it, that's just another example. It's just like yeah. people used to go out in the real world to these houses with the madams who would pimp out the women. Yeah, and now it's just a weird Twitter thread full of OnlyFans models. So it's just it's yeah, the material conditions are not exactly the same. The themes. But what's annoying is it's not even limited to like that comment thread. Is these. These ladies, they often comment under just like something that, that are popular tweets. 
Because often yeah. you're just having a look, and then all of a sudden you're confronted by like, material, and you didn't. Yeah, it's weird. Um, yeah, I mean, and I think that. Yeah, yeah, I think that there's. It was probably like that in the streets of Paris as well. You would be walking around, and then all of a sudden. Yeah, it's in, it's interesting. This I think. Because I don't really, I don't consider myself a prude. And I guess this is kind of like, no, I guess I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say her specifically, but um, there's kind of a, there's kind of a good way to do degeneracy, if that makes sense. Does that make sense? <laughs> there's an aesthetic and moral way to do degeneracy. If you know yeah, I mean. there is an aesthetic way to do it. And then, again, this is, this is what I'm talking about with repeating themes in human problems and conflicts is and maybe, I don't know, maybe this is some sort of Christianic impulse coming out. I do think that humans are at base, like there's some there's some degeneracy in all of us, right? And actually, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing for that degeneracy to be expressed sometimes. Some more in other people, less in others, you know? But I think, you know, it's not something that we should suppress, right? This is, it, it's one of the caricatures of like, you know, patriarchal society that it suppressed this completely. But yeah. I don't know, you look at, like you said, you look at the, madames of paris or the fact that before um the late 19th century like 10 percent of women in london were prostitutes like mm -hmm. not as victorian as you might imagine basically yeah yeah and it's uh, yeah i mean i i don't really know the money history especially in western europe i'm not sure about the like currency history and what was going on in the victorian times when everyone was a prostitute but i'd be willing to bet that there was probably some weird inflation system in inflation phenomenon going on that was like forcing that was forcing women to be to enter into prostitution that's essentially what's happening at least in america well and the world because the u.s dollar is the reserve currency but i mean like that's that's another example of of like how my mundane astrology historical systems analysis is working because it's like i'm sort of thinking about what is going on right now what was going on then like yeah what what sort of themes can we piece together that are that are all linking up but but this i think this is the interesting thing because i mean back then at least in uh i guess london's the hub for this right but like it's all, it's all killing and that sort of stuff and people take the you know they make jokes about these only fans ladies who are like basically giving it all and they're getting the price of a hamburger per month if that mm -hmm. you know and only about 1% of them are even making that, you know. Um, but if you compare that to, um, you know, the prices in London in the late 19th century in relation to wages, it's actually not that far off either. Yeah. Um... I mean, I'm sorry, this is one of the things that annoys me um, about people on the right is they're just like, oh, we need to like return. It's like return to what? Return to what? I know. Return to a London where you can't breathe because there's too much smog. Like they literally have days and days and days on end where you have to stay indoors, and dozens of people died suffocating from smog. And there's ten percent of women are prostitutes. What are we returning to? I know, I know. And the return mindset is weird. The return phenomenon. Well, actually, okay, so I have to say something because the return is interesting as well yes. because it is again leaning into linear time. It's yes. thinking that we can return back along the thread somehow, you know? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Return is like this perversion of cyclical time because yeah. return wants to, exactly what you said, it wants to it wants to go backwards rather than just like see it through, see the, the turning of the wheel through. And mm -hmm. um, and the other thing, I, I this this thought occurred to me very recently, so it's just like on the top of my mind. There's a really interesting like return attitude about decolonial thought and like the advocates for decolonization. Oh, yeah. Like yeah, yeah. they have this like obsession with what they call ancestral knowledge and like this whole um, this whole like oh we need to like protect heritage and we need to go back to heritage and it's just like I don't like we have to stop centering the institutions and like technology is bad all this stuff and and those are also like the decelerationists who are like very against any kind of technological progress. And it's like, you want you want to go back to living in a horrible hut and like hauling water from the well 10 miles away? Like what, 
what impulse is that? It's it's ridiculous. Well, um, it's not an impulse. It's I I think it's from the literature of the French Revolution. It's it's the idea of a noble savage. This is this is Rousseau through and through. And lots of these people have never carried a five liter bucket of water right, that far right, to, right. at all as well. I'm sure if they actually like had a lived experience of the thing, they wouldn't be so keen on returning. But they have this weird idyllic idea, and it's and it's got its weird um, weird sort of perverse zenith in like the Marvel films, basically, with this, this Wakanda place. Oh my God, like, yeah. Like, like most of the anti-clonal academics literally believe in Wakanda. Oh <laughs> it's, yeah, it's this weird- That's like, their theology. It's their Atlantis. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, it is, yeah. They take, they take the mick out of us looking for Hyperborea, but you guys are looking for Wakanda. Come on, guys. <laughs> it's not that different. <laughs> It's true. And of course, like the, what I respect a lot about um, a lot of sort of like the new right or whatever is the, the idea of archaeofuturism, the Guillaume mm. Fay, like you want to maintain tradition and you want to maintain some level of like it, tradition is good. You also want to map that onto the future. You want to be yeah. able to still be looking towards the future. I think that it's a really, um, archaeofuturism is, is really, really interesting and like useful and valuable and i think that that is like a um yeah it's it's there's a lot of astrology very latent in archaeofuturism a lot of the guys like ar archaeofuturist guys would kind of i don't know if they would cringe at me saying that there's latent astrology in there or maybe they'd be into it but um you know all of the guys who are like nuclear energy now and like we need to colonize mars yesterday kind of thing like i wonder if they would be into the astrology well, there's, there's two this is maybe getting a little bit spicy but there's like two um there's there's a duality in that impulse like one side has is kind of a repetition of what the italian futurists were going for mm -hmm. which i would say is like the more nuclear power let's have flying cars let's colonize mars sort of side of things but i think the side that would is that is more aboard with astrology is probably something that's some sort of repetition of like volkish movements or something like this perhaps <laughs> i'm not yeah, saying yeah. it is i'm just saying it's an odd repetition of that yeah yeah, um, yeah yeah totally but i don't know i'm, I'm starting to be okay with the kali yugi you know I'm, I'm becoming a man of the winter you know i feel i feel like this is all kind of like a bad trip and instead of doing the return thing you kind of have to go through the kali yuga you know there's no other way around this absolutely. you have to go through you know yeah absolutely and you know it's funny that you mention um Again, I mean, it's not funny because it's this is just how it goes. You mentioned this is the literature of the French Revolution. Well, guess what? Like, we are entering into a time over the next three years, the outer planets are going to be in the exact same place where they were during the French Revolution. Right. Like, to no one's surprise kind of thing. Like, it is surprise. It's uncanny, but it's also, like, not surprising. That is the whole... That's why people on the internet, on astrology internet, are, are like, oh, my God, Pluto and Aquarius, like... Pluto has not been in Aquarius since the founding of the United States. Um, or like right, like, you know, two years after the Declaration of Independence was signed kind of thing. Um, Pluto was also in Aquarius, yeah, when the revolution broke out in France. Uranus was in Gemini during the American Revolution, during the French Revolution. Uranus is going to be in Gemini in early 2020, the spring of 2026. Um, so, you know, we like these these themes are are it's all it's a circle <laughs> it's all it's all coming back around the horn i just i just hope i'm on the right side of the guillotines you know but apart from that how how does how does one go about changing your perception of time oh i think because like i said i think i had a lots of the neuroses of the linear stuff before and I feel like I've lost it, but I'm not entirely sure how I did it. I'm not sure if you cast, cast some sort of spell on me or whatever. <laughs> Probably. The thing about personal astrology and what's what's really interesting is like, uh, and, and why personal astrology is kind of like the gateway into all of this, is it prompts you to be extra reflective on your life. And I think that it's like, um, and it's real, I think that someone changes their perception of time literally by just incorporating lunar phases into their life. like. Today's a new moon, by the way. Um, happy new moon. We start a new cycle in Sagittarius today, December the 12th, 
thir slash 13th of 2023. Um, incorporating lunar cycles into your life puts things on um, cycles within cycles of, of moments. Like you have the new moon, two weeks later you have the full moon, two weeks after that you have another new moon. Um, I think women are probably predisposed to just like, I mean, we live cyclical time month to month in a way that is just like a lot more present than like a, like men's hormonal cycles, which are just day to day. Um, so that's just like an aside, but, um, but yeah, so incorporating the lunar cycle is really important. Um, every month there's a new moon, every two weeks there's a lunation, but then more than that, you start to get a deeper understanding of things. And you know that the new moon actually initiates a cycle, a six month cycle. So today's new moon in Sagittarius initiates a six month cycle for whatever themes Sagittarius rules over in our lives. And so if you can, if you can sort of track that and be thinking about it six months from now in early June of 2024, we'll have a full moon in Sagittarius and you can sort of look back and say, and take stock and say, well, this was what was happening in my seventh house over the last six months. This is how I've developed. And then you, and then at the next new moon, you say like, I'm going to plant the seeds over the next, over the next six months for this, for the themes of my seventh house kind of thing. And so I think living by the moon is the first step. Uh, how, um, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> how is that any different? from the sort of person who has a LinkedIn profile, putting in a calendar like reminder every 30 days to check their personal development goals. It's not, it's not okay. any different because, but I think that someone's personal development, it's, it's the same. I think someone's personal development goals also is kind of teleological in the sense that like, um, oh, I'm gonna um, like, I wanna do X, Y, and Z in my career. I'm gonna like strive for that promotion. Oh, I got the promotion. Now I'm gonna like think about the next one and what's the next thing and like what's the next salary raise, whatever. Whereas like with astrology, you're sort of every single year around this time, me personally, I'm thinking about my seventh house, themes of my seventh house, because it's around this time that the Sagittarius new moon is happening. Um, and so like I'm not necessarily thinking about like um I'm not, I'm not going in this like linear, like what's the next goal. I'm sort of like, this is the time that I'm always thinking about my personal relationships. And in the beginning of the year, I'm always thinking about like my relationship to money and my relationship to like, uh, inheritances and, and debts and like budgeting, just because that's how my personal star map is, is laid out. So, um, I would say that a, a person on LinkedIn, doing their productivity checklist, they probably are subconsciously or consciously averse to repeating goals. Mm. Right. Yeah. I did, wanna, I did wanna talk about something you brought up just quickly there was um, the connection of circular time, a uh, cyclical time to feminine. And I guess I would, I would argue, I don't know if you agree with this, like linear time has a weird sort of masculine feel to it. And I was yeah, thinking I about it because, I mean, of the obvious one with the, the female is the uh, ovulation cycle and that sort of stuff, um, mm -hmm. which happens in cycles. I mean, there are things about men which also, I guess you could argue, happen in cycles, but it's very overt there with the female, I think. Um, but I was thinking about the way men and women think as well. And ultimately, <laughs> I think, like, linear times kind of focus on telos, like the goal of something, something to be pursued has its mirroring in um, like men's sexuality. Like mm. men, are, men are, whether you like it or not, well, the archetypal man at least is a pursuer, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's something weird about um, linear time and telos, which has a, I guess now I think about it is like, you know, well, you know, linear time is like a, a straight rod, right? But also <laughs> like, you know, if you're pursuing, if you're myopically pursuing one telos, one goal, you're just, you're just, nothing else is important right now. Mm -hmm. this, this is the only drive. So in a way, you're kind of thinking of your dick as well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And well, and I think that it's, um, I think it's more overt for women, because it's just it, you live with it for longer, because it takes a whole month 
And so you're living with these cycles, these windows of time for a whole month, whereas like men are diurnal or men's hormonal cycles are diurnal. And so like you wake up with the sun, you're at your T levels are at a certain place with the sun, like they, they peak when the sun peaks and then they fall at night. And so, and like, it's, it's, it's like a circadian rhythm as well. And so like, you don't really, men are not conscious because they're sleeping at night. They're not conscious of their like, their lower T levels or whatever. They, they're only conscious, they're only conscious of their hormonal levels when their hormonal levels are rising peaking and then falling a little bit. And so like, you're just not, because men are on a diurnal cycle, they miss out on the awareness of a half of the cycle basically. Whereas like women experience a full week of building up to, or yeah, build like a, yeah, follicular phase, like a whole week of building up to the, the crescendo, the peak, which would be like the ovulation phase. Sorry, this is, biology I didn't mean to but um and then and then you have a whole week where you're in that peak window and then you have another week where you're feeling it uh where you're feeling it die down decrescendo and then you have another week whoa my cat um and then you have another week where you're like totally in the like you're dropped and you and you don't feel it's like the low time and you're very you're always aware of it because you're living with it for seven days at a time whereas like when men are asleep they're not really aware of half of that yeah yeah have you ever heard of uh, the juche calendar no i have not so juche is the ideology of north korea which is roughly translates to self-reliance and basically they decided they wanted their own calendar so they did the juche calendar so it starts in uh 1912 which is the birth of the eternal leader kim il-sung and so it's currently um 112 in juche because they just took the Gregorian calendar, calendar and just like shifted it. <laughs> they just shifted it. They didn't actually change the days or anything, which is a bit weird. <laughs> That's amazing. But yeah, one of my, I really want to go to the DMZ so I can get a Juche calendar. <laughs> I'd love to start following, you know. <laughs> yeah, you should. Very time. You should. It's so. It's super interesting. There are a few um, in New Mexico, there are a few farmers uh, who still observe who are like Orthodox Christian um, mm -hmm. farmers. And so they still observe the Julian calendar yeah. and um, they will have expiration like on their products. They'll have expiration dates that are set to Julian time. Mm -hmm. And I see this in the co-op occasionally. It looks really totally <laughs> foreign to me. It looks it's amazing. But it's, yeah. Um, and so I guess, like, if you wanted to change your perception of time, like, you can cut out all the self-development, self-improvement crap, and you can just, like, start day one and, <laughs> like, forget, like, name your own, just make your own calendar. That's one way to do it. But, I mean, to come back to the, <laughs> the, the themes of not repeating mistakes, you know, so maybe you'd be better off borrowing from some past tradition as opposed to... <laughs> Yeah. Just being like, my birthday is the year. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is a big, um, it's a way bigger research topic and research area of interest for me. Um, like specifically, like the rabbit hole of the Gregorian calendar is completely insane. There are so many, like when they, I mean, they, they fix the vernal equinox which yeah. is weird. And then they choose in, at a specific during the Council of Nicaea, like Gregory, he's, you know, 500 years later from the Council of Nicaea in 325 CE. And he chooses that vernal equinox, like that's the vernal equinox that has to be fixed. And like, what's the reason behind that? Like, it's just, um, yeah, there's, there's societies, cultures, their calendars, such as the Juche calendar that are like, I'm the emperor, we're going to start the calendar on my birth year, and that's it. Um, but then there's something that's way more calculated, like the Vatican mm. and the Gregorian calendar. And um, it's like some serious magic. Because And yet, when you change your perception of time, you change your, pers like, that's magic. And you completely, you completely change the way things play out. Have you heard of um, 
ideas around uh, retrocausal. Oh, I'm not going to remember the phrase right, but it's like retrocausal phenomenon. Phenomena. Um, it's this idea that like you like basically like meditate your way back into the past, and you like you change like I don't know. Ideas around retrocausal time are really yeah. crazy. I'll just sounds, leave it at that. Sound, I'll be honest. Sounds a little bit woo woo. It is. I mean, it is. But there's also the the thing. It is woo woo, and like I can't. I'm not explaining I'm, I'm it in the travel. technical terms. <laughs> what you're saying. But there's also like I mean, scientists are also studying this too, and like, and, and they they are trying to analyze like time systems have you heard of the santa fe institute no, no, no. those freaks are so weird um bizarre bizarre institute in the mountains somewhere in santa fe nobody really knows like where they are nobody really knows what they do but they have these like symposia um a lot on time and like predictive analysis like they they try to map time like they are actively studying this and they're also studying retrocausal where like if you can create I guess it's sort of like if you can create a simulation of reality and you can put someone into a into a simulation like they can affect that affects the future because you're like affecting i don't know it's it's weird uh, i need to do some digging on that <laughs> i didn't that's another, that's another topic for another day i don't know i didn't expect that to come up in conversation so i didn't <laughs> read up <laughs> um what is so i just I, I did want to dig on this a little bit. I know it's a big rabbit hole, but I'm, what is the benefit to either Pope Gregory individually or the Catholic Church in locking the vernal equinox? What is the benefit to them? Um, I think it... I mean, on my soapbox, I'm going to say there is no benefit, but um, <laughs> it's about the perception. It fixes your relationship to the sun, and I think that it has... Um, it makes agricultural mechanisms a little bit more stabilized. Okay. Um, someone, another, I was having a conversation with another person a while ago. It probably, possibly standardizes the expectations of economic output, especially in an agrarian society, yes. right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's yeah. a great way of putting it. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's all about, at that time too, it was all about our relationship to the sun and wanting to ma wanting to maximize it um the the time that we have with the sun mm -hmm. but yeah it's interesting i mean again i said in an agrarian society for a reason is that we no longer live in that society you know we have uh hydroponics greenhouses like there's you can get any sort of fruit and vegetable at any time in most places um you can go live in spaceship not, i don't know it's a different different question right but mm -hmm. It almost feels like we do need a new conception of time for, I don't know, maybe, you know, for the future, you know, for our, our, our burgeoning world. I don't, maybe we could, maybe we could split up the days into TikTok size segments or something like this. Well, and I, this is the interesting thing. And I don't, I'm definitely can't, I'm not technical enough to speak to this, but like the math of Bitcoin cryptographic cash system, it's also a clock. Bitcoin is also. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so a lot of people, like the really hardcore Bitcoin maxis, will be like, this is how we're going to tell time. Once we've yeah. reached hyper Bitcoinization, it's going to be a Bitcoin clock and calendar. Yeah. Well, the, 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 the thing is, and people don't realize this, I think it's, it's very opaque. And I, unfortunately, I think it's because of the stuff Nick Land's written on it. But there is huge, like, philosophical implications for just our metaphysical experience of reality in general from the fact that um, Bitcoin is interfacing with reality, but tracking time at the same time. Yeah. And any all cryptocurrencies that work in the same way do the same thing. But obviously, um, there's you know, computer science considerations about having a stable network to do this sort of thing. Yeah. But it, it weird, it's weird. It sort of outsets it outs, outsources a metaphysical experience of time to reality itself which is strange and has huge implications, but massive. Yeah. Like I said, unfortunately people have written on this are, they write very <laughs> opaquely. So it's difficult. Um, 
Yeah. And the computer scientists don't really, most of the computer scientists don't really see the connection, you know, between, they know it's no. a car, they don't know that how it interfaces with metaphysical reality. You know? Right, exactly, exactly. They know it's a clock, they know that it's gonna, and, and, oh, yeah. Once you start mapping, yeah, whole other rabbit hole, because then once you, once you start mapping astrology onto it, then it's just like a whole other, whole other situation. It has huge metaphysical implications, but it just, yeah, it has astrological implications as well. Um, and one has to wonder, was Satoshi an astrologer, which we've <laughs> asked. We, we've spoken about this, yes. <laughs> but yeah, it's, um, I do think that uh, uh, in the same way that there's the pyramids of Egypt, the pyramids of Mesoamerica, um, and like things like Serpent Mound, all of those things, like the way that those are so en enigmatic, like they were, I, f they're the same way as, like they have the same sort of properties as Bitcoin. Like they interface with the reality and are also telling time based yeah. on their align celestial alignments. Mm -hmm. And so, I don't know, a hundred years from now, a thousand years from now, the Bitcoin network um, will be antiquated, but it'll be enigmatic like the pyramids were right yeah, and you can also imagine i mean if the kali yuga really does go it's up you know maybe people will like archaeologically look back on bitcoin like they do look on stonehenge and wonder wonder what these strange um digital megaliths are for you know what's the mm -hmm. purpose of these things they seem to track something but we don't know what exactly they seem so, to track uh bored apes and strange yeah. anime miladies <laughs> I love, I love, you know, humanity's great. They have, we have all these amazing technologies, you know, the philosophers and the scientists come along with, you know, this interfaces with metaphysical reality. Look at all this interesting stuff we can do. We can have cryptographic voting that's public and secure. And, da -da -da, and then people are like, you know, using it to watch pornography. It's like, yep. cool. <laughs> or like 99.9% yeah. .9 of it is being used to watch pornography. The arc of humanity will always bend toward degeneracy. And that's why it is important to make it to make it aesthetic. It's an important <laughs> aesthetics yeah. are important because degeneracy is going to be the rhythm through the whole <laughs> through the whole human history. So you might as well make it pretty. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in a whole like don't meet your hero sort of way. I hope we never find out who Satoshi is really. I hope it's like kind of buried enough now that no one will ever know. I hope it becomes like a King Arthur sort of thing, you know? I think it will. I think I truly think that it it's yeah, on that trajectory kind of already. Now for it to like be known unless it was deliberate, right? Wait, say that again. I missed I think like enough time has passed for it to be unlikely that it will be uncovered unless it is deliberately done so, you know. I think so. And I think that it I think that that was also like a part of the plan too to be Probably. to be pseudonymous. Um and which is again like marking the importance of um mythology and self mythologizing and making sure that there's um that there's an air of mystery i mean nobody nobody really knows who hermes trismegistus is or was um and like the Kabbalion is published under the three initiates it's not published under authors kind of thing and that's like that the Kabbalion is like the most important esoteric occult text there is so yeah. well i mean likewise i mean we we know a lot about it because it's one of the most studied things ever right. but there is a lot of mystery surrounding the authorship of the bible for example yeah yeah the confusion about languages and the meaning of words and stuff like this and again coming back to material conditions not being everything in a sense the material conditions would be better if we knew exactly who did what and when and why but it but coming back to the archetypal nature of us our fallen selves it's almost better that we don't know it, it is to, which is strange and so counterintuitive but it's true yeah but it's true and also an interesting thing about the bible is um the four gospel new testament gospel authors matthew mark luke and john they're also like i mean they're named as apostles or whatever like they're they're Na like we sort of know their origins um we can kind of like locate uh, but do we know who they were in history who they actually were but matthew mark luke and john the way that they are depicted like illustratively they map onto the fixed signs of taurus leo scorpio and aquarius 
and like and and that's for a reason as well like it's that's yeah that that's that's for a reason as well and so like it's intentional but it's like kind of obscured and so and like and you have these identities that just kind of like you have these identities that morph into archetypes that morph back into identities that then you know, yeah yeah I, I, I suspect there's more i mean because a lot of it was written in greek and there's an obvious connection i suspect there's more to the connection i mean maybe you can tell me about this i don't know because i'm ignorant about it maybe i think there's more to the connection between deliberate astrology and the bible than we probably know and was probably retrogradely changed or suppressed by the later church you know as a yeah. rival it's a rival faction perhaps yeah and i don't even know if it was a rival faction i think that it was just a gate kept thing i heard i okay well okay i'm gonna finish my thought and then i'm gonna go on the other tangent but um uh it it was astrology was very much incorporated into the early christian church um and it was because because astrology was just like a background daily practice everybody knew high highly educated mathematicians physicists scientists like they you had to know astrology in order to be a worthwhile scientist in antiquity and so um as you're trying to establish and maintain a whole new religion you're obviously going to incorporate the practice of the time you you want to and and the early christian church wanted to um was also full of educated people. So there were definitely astrologers as part of it. And then you get into um, the like Renaissance period and you have this like, and and you, I can't remember exactly which Pope it was, um, but it was around, it was like around give or take a century around the Gregorian calendar time um, when they like made astrology right, excommunicable. Yeah, yeah. And so, but my theory is, is that like, what actually happened is the church, the Renaissance church absorbed astrologers into their enclave and most of the cardinals like or, or other high level clergymen were astrologers in secret. And then they had to go on this like crusade of like excommunicating astrologers or even killing, killing them uh -huh. um, to make it seem like it was a rival. But I think that it's like, I, I think that it was very much still wrapped in at that time. The other thing, the tangent that I was going to go on, I have no idea if this is true because I never looked it up. I should at some point, if I remember, I always kind of forget it. But I was I was in Roswell at the UFO Museum and uh, there was this like UFO researcher guy, um, also one of the like builders, founders of the museum. And he was giving a lecture and uh, he's full on conspiracy theorist, like, but also very like measured and grounded man and like very much like he has a healthy skepticism about lots of different like uap U ufo videos on the internet but anyway he mentioned i forget the context of the question that another person had asked him that there are there's the four largest telescopes in the world two of them are owned by nasa one of them is owned by the vatican mm -hmm. i don't know if that's true <laughs> right okay uh-huh uh -huh. but so i was like holy shit <laughs> um is it actually in the Vatican? That's what he said. Okay. Is it a modern telescope or is it like a... I don't know. I don't know. I, I never looked it up because I was just like so... I was so delighted by that little factoid. And I was like, I, I think that I've kind of been avoiding, subconsciously avoiding looking it up because I don't want it to be fake. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, that's, that's the issue. I, I often don't look these things up and start telling people facts that I've been told and they're never, never true. So, uh, yeah. I know. It's bad. <laughs> cool. Before we, before we wrap up, I did want to ask you a question. Where, where does the pseudonym Glass Delusions come from? Does it mean anything or is it just one of those random ones? Um, it means something. So the original, like the actual definition of Glass Delusions is it was a mass hysteria event in the 19th century where young women um, thought that their bones were so fra were as fragile as glass. So they were afraid to go outside. They were afraid to injure themselves because they thought that they would shatter into a thousand pieces and um that's yeah it's so mass hysteria glass delusions and then also um i started to i started to realize something about the way that people project on twitter and how like you sometimes sometimes you say things and it hits this like resonance or that's maybe the a wrong metaphor because that's sound and, and mirrors are sort of are, are based on light but it hits this kind of like 
refraction or it hits the light in just the right way. Like sometimes you tweet things into the void and people will just like run with it and they just project onto you. And people will get like, I find that what makes people the most angry on social media is when they see themselves reflected in some sort of like truth. And, and so like glass delusions is sort of just about like, you know, what, how are you, like, how am I using social media to sort of obscure my own reflection or make it more clear? Um, I ask myself that question. And then also when I, um, and this is like the personal uh, spin on the, on the pseudonym, when I take road trips around New Mexico, which I have to for my, for my work, I carry around a very large mirror with me and I'm always like, and I always try to like photograph like the landscape reflecting off of the mirror without me in it. I try to, I try to photograph that as just like an ongoing sort of collage of my relationship to the real world and like, but then also my own absence from it. Mm -hmm. so. so anyway, is there anything you're working on that you want to plug right now? Um, not at the moment. You can, no, I'm nothing, no huge project is coming up mm. yet. Um, you can subscribe to my Substack, which is at cosmographics.substack.com. Yeah. <laughs> um, you want I put out digest of astrological news is pretty good. Thanks. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Well, happy uh, almost winter solstice. Happy new moon and happy almost winter solstice. Well, you have to tell me when we're going to post this, when the perfect time is. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Maybe we I don't know any of that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. The winter solstice will be December 20th or 21st. Um, oh, actually, one thing that I will leave people with, and, and this is another way to, like, change your perception of time. Um, so this is a practice that is, like, r across lots of different Western European folkways. So, like, this, you can find this everywhere. In Spanish, it's called cabanuelas. Um, I'm not sure what it's called in like any sort of like po folk, uh, uh, like pagan folk religion. I'm not sure. I've I've only heard it sort of. People call them omen walks or something. Anyway, what you do is th there's this idea to these folkways where on the day of the winter solstice you start counting down or you start counting twelve days after the winter solstice and you and on the first day after the winter solstice you go for what's called like an omen walk or you you go to take the omens and you go outside and you just like wander around and you just kind of like take in symbols and you just sort of write like after you go for a walk or go for a stroll you take in the symbols you observe them you write them down and that is going to be whatever sort of symbols jump out at you, whatever story jumps out at you, that's going to be your prediction for the first month of the year, the first day after the solstice. And then on the second day after the solstice, you take another, you, you take the omens again and you go for another walk and you just start to notice things and you start to notice symbols. You try to like derive meaning from these, from symbols and what's happening to you. That's going to be your prediction for the second month of the year and so on and so forth. And so you, um, Every day for 12 days, you go outside, you just sort of like look for omens around you and that and and that's supposed to mirror the next year of your life. Um, in astrology, it's much more it's much more calculated. Um, it's called progressions. And that takes like a lot of takes a lot of math and, and trigonometry to, to work out progressions for an individual. Um, but it's the same sort of thing, like every day of your life, like the first day of your life predicts the first year of your life. When you're three days old, that predicts what your life is going to be like when you're three years old. So it's like, it's a, it's a interesting relationship to time. I did a Cabanuelas like omen walk thing last year for the first time. Um, and it was really uncanny. It was really, really interesting. Like I was just reading through my, um, I was just reading through my, my December which was like January 3rd of 2023 kind of thing was like my predictions for December and it was kind of crazy. So yeah. <laughs>